Hi, welcome to Small Axe Farm. Uh, my name is Evan, and my wife Heidi and I um, have been building this farm over the last uh, really 18 years. Um, we're a, an off-grid, um, regenerative, no-till vegetable farm. Um, we grow organically, and we're just going to give you a little tour around uh, where we are at this point in time. So we're kind of in our in our dooryard. Is this is what it'd be called in Vermont? Uh, so it's kind of our front yard, and behind me here we have our um, what we call our seedling house, which is our only heated greenhouse on the property, and also the place where we grow our seedlings. Um, and this is new to us. We've never had a heated greenhouse before, um, so we're pretty excited about this. This is our second year growing in it. Um, and as part of that heated greenhouse is this outdoor wood boiler. This is a, a highly efficient wood gasification boiler. So that's how we heat our greenhouse. And this does take electricity to run fans. So we, that's powered with our solar power system, which we'll see a little later. And then behind me here is our wash pack building, which is uh, an energy, uh, super energy efficient building. It's still under construction, as you can see, but it's got 12 inch thick cellulose walls and it's a passive solar design and it's heated with radiant floors also by this same boiler. Um, so this is critical for us to be able to farm off-grid and to expand our farm is to have infrastructure that doesn't take a lot of power that still um, does what we need it to do. We're gonna take a little tour inside. I'm gonna put on my mask because we've got some employees working in here. So as we come inside the building here, we've got our um, greens packing area, you can see all of our labels hanging, and this is where we bag and label all of our salad greens, which is um, a fair percentage of our farm business is salad greens. And what's really nice is in the winter time, um, in the shoulder seasons when we're harvesting greens out of that greenhouse, it's also attached to this building. So there are some days when we're harvesting microgreens inside and greens from that greenhouse and, and it's snowing outside and uh, we're warm and comfortable, which is not a feeling we're used to. Um, extending the season farming. Over in this area here, you'll see one of our employees, Kyle, washing trays. And this area over here is where we grow our microgreens. They've all just been harvested. And the next round is stacked and germinating on these, on these shelves here. Um, so Generally, what we do is we'll germinate them on these racks and then we lay them out here and they're all grown on soil with sunlight. All right, so this is going to be our walk-in cooler. It's not finished yet, but we um, recently upgraded our solar power system to have enough power to have a cooler powered by a cool bot. So we're really excited for the time when this is ready. Um, it's really gonna save us a lot of work. And this is our washroom in here. Um, this is where we wash greens, process root vegetables, um, and bunch vegetables. Um, we, we, um, when we built this building, we made sure we had washable walls just in this room. And then you can see we have water accessible all over the building coming out of the ceiling um, so that we can have short hoses, short spray hoses, and so that our washroom can be adaptable. Okay, so now we're walking towards our house. We've always had the luxury of living right in the middle of our garden, so that's kind of where we like to be. Um, we, uh, we, that little cabin there you see with the porch um, is where we live for a bunch of years. It's a little 12 by 16 cabin, and we live there without any electricity or running water for quite some time. And then we built this timber frame straw bale house. Um, that attaches to it that has super efficient straw bale walls. Um, so, yep, this is kind of where we live. And for many years, we grew all of our seedlings in the house. We even grew microgreens in there. And um, we spent a lot of years getting the farm out of our kitchen and out of our living room. Um, and uh, it's mostly worked. <laughs> So as we walk on by the house here, we will um, come into our, our homestead gardens, which are part of our farm. Um, these were our first gardens, and many of these beds are, um, these are kind of our lowest terrace, and then they, they kind of terrace up the hill, up behind the cabin, up behind our summer kitchen, and we have some clay pizza ovens underneath that tarp there. Um, and these were our first gardens, and we always say they're also going to be our last gardens when, we're, uh, when, we, when we get too old to farm and too, too old to climb the hill anymore. These will be the last area we farm as well. 
The soil in these beds um, has been no-till soil for 16 years. These the oldest beds. They were the, our first gardens and um, where we learned how to farm without tillage, which is kind of uh, something that we've we've always done for the most part, although we, we use the tiller to open ground. Well, we can take a quick side detour here um, up by our cabin, which is, is now our kitchen. And when we were living in this little cabin with a, with, um, with a young baby, trying to preserve all of our own food and um, manage our gardens and our horses, um, it got pretty full. And so we built this summer kitchen out here, which is where we did all of our canning and food preservation in the summertime. Um, and we were young and whimsical, so we put a sod roof on it, which has actually been amazing. We planted wildflowers up there at first, and, and then uh, now it's mostly moss, which is beautiful. Um, and then if we have a rainy summer, some plants will grow. But it's a, um, and for a long time after that, it was our part of our wash pack facility for our farm where we packed our CSA shares before we had our farm building. And now it's um, back to our kind of our summer kitchen again and place where we eat out on summer evenings. So as we walk up behind the cabin here, we have our, our root cellar. When we built our house, we had an excavator to move some soil to build our house. We had them build, dig a hole back here, and we poured, we poured a, a concrete foundation for the root cellar, and then we didn't get to it, and then it all collapsed in, and we dug it out, and we dug it out probably two more times um, before we finally built our root cellar, which is a, a slip form concrete and stone technique that we used. Um, and this is still where we keep a lot of our vegetables cool, as well as storing food for our family and storing root crops over the winter. Um, and until our walk-in cooler is up and running in the summertime, we use the root cellar with ice in it, which works really well to keep our crops cool. Although we, we never hold on to crops for more than 36 hours at maximum. So it's pretty small, but you can see it's packed full of veggies right now. And then we're also germinating spinach and claytonia and other crops that um, like a cool place to germinate. So it's got a lot of uses for it. As we move past, uh, past the house here, we've, we, we've got an orchard that we planted when we first um, uh, bought our property. And before we even had water, we hauled water in with buckets um, to water all these plum and apple and pear trees. Um, lots of heirloom varieties of apples and stuff. And, and those are just for our homestead use. And uh, they haven't been pruned in a couple years because the farm's been so busy, but one day they'll be pruned again. And our, our uh, trusty black lab farm dog, Sally, is hunting voles in the, in the, in the blackberry bushes. Um, and uh, for, the, for your, those of you out there that have vole problems, uh, black labs can be trained to hunt voles really effectively. There are many days where she will eat um, probably over a dozen voles a day, and that's just what we see. We're now gonna walk into what we call our lower field. We, we logged our property with draft horses in the beginning of our farm um, to build all of our buildings. We don't have draft horses anymore, but we, we, this is our tack shed down here, this little wooden shed, and um, behind it over here is our horse barn where our horses lived, and now we kind of store farm stuff in there. This lower field here used to be our horse pasture, and we just, uh, it's about a quarter acre, and we just turned it into, um, into more growing space probably about three years ago. Um, this is its, I guess it's third full growing season here um, on these beds. And we have a couple of farmer's friend caterpillar tunnels on the far end of this area which we occasionally move. We haven't moved in a little while, but we'll, we'll move them to different beds down in this area here. And as you can kind of get a sense of the hillside here, um, th this, is, this is a pretty steep area and most of our farm is on a hillside and most of it's pretty steep. Um, and, uh, but we have systems that work well for that. We don't have any significant problems with it besides, you know, it's slippery when you're walking around here in the ice and snow trying to harvest greens out of, out of row cover. And, it doesn't work well for any big machinery, so we don't use any big machinery. All the tools we use can be carried by hand. So we don't have tractors or use tillers or any large machines like that. And we've got a, 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 about 40 blueberry bushes here, which um, on good years we sell quite a few of, and on years when they're not as good, we eat them all. So we're gonna walk up um, through our orchard, up to the top of the hill, and on the way we'll see our, um, our solar array. 
So we power our farm with about six kilowatts of solar power at this point. That powers all of our lighting for our building, our green spinning, irrigation, so a well pump, and any other power tools, battery charging that we need. And our solar panels are on adjustable racks. You can actually move these up and down depending on what time of year it is. So uh, in the middle of summer, they'll, these haven't been adjusted because they were just put up recently, but in the middle of the summer, they'll face more to the sky and in the winter, they'll be more vertical. So our gardens are about 100 plus vertical feet. Our big field is about 100 plus vertical feet above our house. So every day, many times a day, we walk up and down this steep hill. We can also drive a truck up, which we do. So right now our farm is, we're kind of at the end of summer and we're transitioning our farm from main season summer crops and every available place is now planted with whatever crop we can fit in that we can harvest before the growing season ends. So as beds come free, recently we've been planting with seedlings of like, of head lettuce, bok choy, salad turnips. And now we're getting to the point where the only thing that we can plant are, will be young greens. Um, but we'll plant, the, our last greens planting in the fields will be uh, around September 21st. But those will live a lot of the second part of their lives under row cover. So r over here we have um, a movable greenhouse that we moved for many years, but we've decided to stop moving. Next time we replace the plastic, we're going to um, make it stationary just because we just we have enough high tunnels and cat tunnels now that we don't really need that Optionality of moving it and it takes a lot of time in a busy farming season to move a movable tunnel Especially because we kind of designed the rolling part ourselves, and it's kind of labor-intensive to move it This greenhouse was all cucumbers main season cucumbers and it's now been transitioned into salad greens and we'll harvest that round of salad greens and then we'll plant a whole nother round that we'll be able to harvest probably into December out of there that will just be protected under row cover. This is our tomato house this year. Um, so full of all different kinds of tomatoes, heirlooms and cherry tomatoes primarily, and these Juliet um, paste tomatoes in the front here. The whole area you've seen um, would be completely covered by forest now. When we bought this land, it was all covered with trees with some openings here and there, and we cleared it off. There still are large stumps in, in our garden beds and places. Um, but this particular area here at the top of the hill was traditionally used by the farmers who owned this land before for growing potatoes and corn for dry farming. Um, so this was the first, and we knew that because we met the woman who grew up on this farm. And so we put our first storage gardens up here, growing garlic and potatoes, um, dry corn. And then we eventually kind of, this became our main growing space at the top of the hill here. We grow a, a lot of salad greens. Um, we grow a, a, actually a fairly regular amount every week from mid-March all the way through December. Um, so in the shoulder seasons, we're really heavy on salad greens um, in the spring and in the fall. And in the, in the summer, we're kind of more of a typical farm. We've got salad greens, um, but, but and we grow all the other vegetables as well. As we head into the fall here, we're, we're planting a lot of salad greens and we use, um, in the last several years, we've used the paper pot transplanter a lot. It's an integral part of our system. It often allows us to get one extra crop in um, a year in, in beds. So instead of maybe getting an average of three to four, we can average four to five crops um, in many of our beds. Um, although there are still many beds which will only average three crops a year and sometimes two. But we don't have any beds besides for maybe kale, which is planted in early spring and will go all the way through up into December that, don't, that just have one crop on them. And then we also do a lot of direct seeding. We use, um, we use a JP5, um, so a Jang um, five row speed seeder um, for our direct seeded salad greens. And um, although before that we used the six point seeder um, from Johnny's, which also worked really well, but we like the JP5 because it uh, works better in more conditions for us in our situation. You can see some sprinklers going behind me. I, I would say farming off grid for us, water has been the biggest challenge because that's where most of our power goes is to power that well pump. 
And even still, we have about an acre under production. And if it's dry for a long period of time, which it isn't often in Vermont, although it has been this summer, um, we just really can't keep up because we can only run four sprinklers at once. So at some point we have to start, there's gotta be some triage and some stuff's not gonna get watered. And particularly because we do grow a lot of salad greens and quick growing crops, we have higher water demands at certain times with all those young crops always going in. The paper pot transplanter as well, those seedlings require a lot more water even than traditional seedlings to keep alive. Um, so water is one of our challenges and for any off-grid farm you know exactly what I'm talking about um, unless you happen to have a nice gravity-fed spring above your, above your fields. So this is a new area on our farm that we, uh, this little section we call Side Hill. We just opened it up this year. We tarped it for a little bit last, um, last fall. We didn't, and we didn't spend much time tarping it, but um, this is all storage crops for this year. We have a few odds and ends beds here that had a bunch of onions and extra summer squash and peppers. Um, but a, a lot of winter squash, potatoes. We kind of expanded our, our storage crops this year. Um, because of COVID and because of the demand locally and people's kind of feeling insecure about food in general. Um, so we decided that this was a good year to expand. And generally, if we're going to make new beds, we will either tarp them for a long time or in this situation, we tarped it for a short time. But everything here is under either weed mat or landscape fabric. Um, of some kind. So these crops are also being used to transition this land into semi-weed free growing space. Um, and this winter squash is going to come out next week and that will all be planted with greens. And likewise those potatoes are going to come out as soon as we have enough cool nights to cool down the root cellar. We will um, we'll pull those to potatoes and put them in for storage for the winter. Um, and then kind of turn this all over and this fall we'll be growing greens. The greens also are a really important part of our transitioning of weedy land into good growing land because the more quick growing crops we can put on that land, the faster we can burn through the weed seed bank that's going to be in there. Um, and there are also many tree stumps, roots, and all that kind of stuff in these new beds that we'll, we slowly let decompose and work around rather than having an excavator come pull them out. So that's kind of our approach is just kind of let nature take its course. I think another thing that's really important about our farm is that uh, our fields are not in isolation. Um, we're, we're surrounded by forest and on the edge of that forest is edge space that is home to a lot of different animals. Our forest backs up against our other local farmers forests. So there's deep forest habitat around our farm. We have scarlet tanagers and many other birds that can only live in deep forest ha habitat, but we'll see them on the edges of the fields sometimes. And then if you look down below our gardens here, um, we leave a, a, always big sections of our meadows unmowed and we won't mow them for, we'll only mow them like once every two or three years. And for that reason, we have really low insect pressure on our farm. That biodiversity is that some people will plant, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll plant little sections for diverse plants and pollinators. And, but we just kind of let nature do that on the edges of our fields. And um, that's, as soon as we stop grazing our horses around our gardens and in that situation, everything was always kind of kept down. As soon as we stopped doing that, we noticed that all of our insect pressure just started to go down steadily. And so we still have all of the insects, cucumber beetles, potato beetles, flea beetles, um, cabbage moths. We have all of those things, but they ne the peaks aren't very big and they don't last very long. Um, and that's been consistent ever since we haven't had our horses grazing, which has been for about seven years. And mostly it was just after that, we just kind of got behind with mowing the pasture. And then the second year we didn't. And then we went into the third year and it was like, hey, where are all the bugs? And um, so we just feel that's important to note that our farm is not in isolation and that part of our success is that we're surrounded by all this biodiversity. Um, and we're really fortunate to live in a rural area where we, that's possible. Hey, well, thanks for going on this, uh, this, this tour here and um, feel free to ask questions. Um, you can direct message us on our Instagram page um, and we have a website, smallaxfarm.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have any questions.